This morning we cover the last chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28. Uh, for the last seven chapters, Luke has been tracing this, what I call the fourth missionary journey of Paul, uh, which he conceived of in the spirit with gospel goals and intentions, a journey which would take him from Jerusalem um, to the center of the Roman Empire, to Rome itself, to, to make his case before Caesar. And his plan was to reach out from Rome um, uh, then further to the western part of the empire with the gospel. Um, but it becomes clear as this journey progresses that um, the itinerary for this journey has been set by Christ and, and, and not by Paul. It included a, a number of free nights accommodation in a one-star uh, hotel with a group called Prison, um, with single bed, 40 bed and no bed rooms. Um, Paul had run up quite a few Voyager miles by this point on his first three missionary journeys, but somehow he could only secure a, a, a ship uh, along with other prisoners uh, on the Titanic uh, with uh, economy class tickets and uh, thrown in for free with this great package deal for missionaries only was a three month uh, beach holiday um, on, the, uh, on an island called Malta. So that's where we pick up the narrative uh, this morning, Acts 28, Paul's Maldives vacation blog, if you want to call it that, Acts 28. Paul has been shipwrecked on the island of Malta, en route from Jerusalem to Rome. Um, the narrative in Acts chapter 28 has got four major sections, four scenes, four distinct settings. Um, if you were, Paul on the island in verses 1 to 10, uh, Paul at sea in verses 11 to 16 as he journeys back to Rome, Paul at Rome in verses 17 to 27, and then Paul in prison in verses 28 to 31, and we'll, we'll look at each of those sections in turn, and then I will try to uh, pull the whole narrative together. So firstly then, Paul on the island, Acts 28, verses 1 to 10. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta, the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no more misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place where the lands were, uh, were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hosp hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put us on board, put on board whatever we needed. So they make it through this terrible storm, and they find themselves shipwrecked on the island of Malta, they don't know what island it is at first, but they come to uh, find out that it's the island of uh, Malta. And I thought it's helpful just to look at a, a map for a moment so we can see what happened. Um, as you can see here, the red line traces uh, Paul's fourth missionary journey, if you were. And if you um, have a look at this map and then just open up your Bibles back to Acts chapter 27, we can see how it gives us the details of this journey in verses 4 to 8. Acts 27 verse 4, putting out to sea, from there we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And so that tells us why they went around Cyprus as they did, to try and gain some protection from the wind. That was the only way they could go. When we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus. And there you can see Snidus um, on your left. As the wind didn't allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmoni. 
And here you can see again why they had to go down and sail uh, around Crete, as it were, to get some shelter from the wind. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. And, and Fair Havens is there on that south side of, um, of Crete. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of cargo and of the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbour was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbour of Crete. So they really want to go, uh, you know, 100 kilometers or so further up that southern coast of the island of Crete. And then the winds are at first favorable, but no sooner have they left, then this violent wind uh, seizes the, the ship and carries it off in a direction um, that the, they can't stop, they can't control, um, as we saw in chapter 27. And yeah, we can see that it carries them uh, off a thousand kilometers away. Um, but if you look at the picture, um, yeah, you see that God was, uh, was taking them in, 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 in almost exactly uh, the right direction. He just needed them to spend the winter uh, on this island of Malta rather than on, on, on the island of Crete. And that just reminds us that even when we've lost control of things, and even when we think God has lost control of things, and even when it seems like everything is chaos and, and all our plans are, are, are sunk, God is still in control and He's still carrying us forward according to His plans. He's, God is always working all things together for gospel good. Then in verse 2 there it says, The native people showed us unusual kindness. And the word there uh, for, that's been translated native people is barbaroi, which uh, could be translated uh, barbarians uh, and maybe conjures up ideas of uh, wild tribal savage people on, on an uncivilized island um, but that's not at all what the word means um, the Greek word here yeah, is used of people who who spoke their no native language rather than uh, the Greek language so Rome had done much to spread Greek culture and Greek language throughout the empire in order to facilitate communication and trade um, but there were still pockets of people who who resisted that influence and, and stuck to, to speaking their, 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 their native language and holding on to their native culture. And this was the word used to describe these people. And this might explain why there's nothing in the narrative about Paul preaching or teaching or evangelizing, no mention of a church being established. Um, it, it may well be that communication was very difficult and, and, and you know, only limited and, and, and was through you know, a few translators who possibly had uh, some understanding of the Greek language as well. And here we can see the, the, the natives are helpful. They make this bonfire in order to warm the sailors because it's begun to rain. And Paul is not above being part of this and, and gathering up sticks to put on the bonfire. And as he does this, this viper attaches itself to Paul's arm. And, and the locals uh, understand this is a poisonous viper and they, they're all believing that he's going to die. And here you can see they're very superstitious. Um, uh, evil has befallen this man and therefore he must be an evil man that's their conclusion and uh, this same kind of superstition uh, still exists in our world and, and is very prominent in Africa today uh, when bad things happen to a person someone gets sick or something goes wrong it must be some evil spirit uh, it must be some angry ancestor or, or some bitter relative that has put a curse on me and the newspapers are, are full of adverts for, you know, um, to come consult this medicine man, this person uh, of one kind or another who could uh, break this curse, who could, uh, you know, break the power, this evil power that's at work in your life and, and free you from it. And this worldview is, is one in which uh, the world is controlled by many gods and many different forces and many spirits and unseen forces that determine the outcome of our lives and the course of our lives and, and religion is really designed to, to manipulate these forces in some way to protect ourselves from them. That's all that religion is. However, Paul has received a direct word from God, the God whom he worships and believes in, and God who said, you will appear before Caesar in Rome. So he knows the outcome of this 
narrative, as it were, this outcome of the story. He knows God controls the storms, God controls the snakes, God controls every single event in our lives according to His gospel purposes. And so Paul has nothing to fear, nothing to be anxious about. He believed, as he told the sailors, that, the sailors, that it would happen just as God had said. God's will would prevail over every other force of nature, of evil, natural or spiritual. That's the Christian worldview. God is sovereign in every way. He's sovereign over everything, every plan, every purpose, every decision, every force. And He's accomplishing all things, working all things together for His gospel good. And as it turns out in this account, we can see exactly how that is accomplished because when Paul is not affected by the snake, um, they, the, 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 the locals change their mind about him. He's, he's not an evil man, he must be a god of some kind. And now Paul has got a, a, a much more elevated view in their eyes and presumably this gave him gospel opportunities to explain to them where such power comes from, where such protection actually comes from. Now it's interesting here, yeah, what they, they make a comment here in verse um, 3, when he had uh, ga gathered the sticks and had fastened on his hands, verse 4, they said he must be a murderer, a murderer and justice has not allowed him to live. And the word justice there you'll notice in verse 4 is in capital letters because this was the Greek word for the goddess of justice and revenge. And the idea here is that although Paul had escaped uh, from the storm, um, he deserved to be punished because he was a murderer and justice found him out. The goddess of justice made sure that he didn't get away with it and he got his rightful due. And again, this world view, this view of justice is prominent in our world still today. That somehow justice will prevail. So, so I must just make sure that I'm on the right side of justice. I, that my good works outweigh my bad works. That that the scale is tipping in my favor, as it were, that I, that I must make up for any wrongs I've done uh, by doing some good and, and, and ensure that the balance is kept straight because I don't want to be found on the wrong end of the scale. But that's not a Christian worldview. Christians believe that God's justice, He's the God of justice, He's the God of all justice, and His justice has been satisfied fully and finally and only in Jesus Christ. As it turns out, Paul is a murderer, and, and he did deserve death, and he did deserve to be punished. But because of the gospel, Christians don't live in fear of God's punishment, retribution, retributive justice. God is not going to take out revenge on us because His wrath, His revenge, His justice has been satisfied by punishing Jesus Christ on the cross. And Christians who believe in Christ are therefore justified. We stand in a right relationship with God, not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of Christ's work on our behalf. His satisfaction of God's wrath. That is the gospel. That is a Christian worldview. And that gives us a whole new way of interpreting the world. We're not walking around just waiting to get what is our due. Jesus Christ took what is our due. And then of course we can see here that they respond after seeing that Paul is rescued by, by, by regarding him in verse 6 there as some kind of God. And, and that's idolatry. When Paul doesn't get sick or die, now he must be a God to have such power over evil and over nature. And again, the world today is still full of idolatry. Pe people making gods out of other people, out of other things, uh, other places. And the idea behind idolatry is that, is that um, this God controls a certain sphere of the world, which I can't control. He, he controls something. There's gods of fertility, there's gods of rain, there's, there's gods of protection, there's gods of war. And so if I can win the favor of this God, if I can get this God to be on my side, then they will do for me what I cannot do for myself. And so the whole point of religion is to appease or to manipulate or to flatter or, or try to control and coerce this God into getting the benefits that come from their control over this realm over which they have control. And, and we see certainly something of this dynamic developing here in the narrative. In, in verse 7 it tells us that um, they were well received and, and, and they were entertained by the chief man and maybe the chief magistrate of the island and, and after Paul heals his uh, father, the whole city is coming out flocking for uh, bringing their sick to Paul to be healed by him. 
So, so you know, they are controlled by superstition. And uh, they're controlled by this fear of justice, this idea that, that our good works must outweigh our bad and, and, and that we must just make up for our bad works by good, otherwise justice will come and get us. And, and they, they're controlled by idolatry, this desire to manipulate the gods, to, to try and uh, get power from them for what I need. And so many churches in Africa are so full of so-called Christians who are more like these pagan islanders than they are like Christians. They haven't embraced a Christian understanding of the world, a Christian worldview. They're controlled by superstition and fear. They believe that they'll be justified or condemned on the, on the basis of their works. And they flock to the so-called man of God um, so that he can do powerful works to, to heal them and to help them. And they just want to be anointed and have this man lay their hands on him, even as these islanders do. And like these islanders in verse 10, they'll, they'll lavish gifts on this man of God and, and they'll pay their dues to him anything to gain his favor. Nowhere in this text are we told that anyone is converted or any church is planted. Because this is not the kind of faith that saves. This is not saving faith. African churches are filled with this kind of paganism, which falls short of Christian faith, saving faith, coming to Jesus not to be healed primarily, not to have my problems removed, not to, not to get my own way and control of these evil forces, but coming to Jesus to be forgiven of my sin and reconciled with the one and only God who rules over all things. So secondly, here we see Paul at sea in verses 11 to 16. Paul at sea. After three months we set sail in a ship that had withered wintered in the island, the ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Putioli. There we found brothers, and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So in this paragraph, Graf Paul makes his way up to Rome and he finally arrives. And what stands out in this text is verse 14 and 15. This wonderful, warm reception that Paul receives from the believers in Rome. He doesn't know these people from a bar of soap. He's never met them before. Now, they come from a vastly different culture and ethnicity to his own. And yet the gospel has gone before Paul and he's converted these people into family, into brothers and sisters in Christ. And we told in verse 14 and 15 that Paul was warmly greeted along the way as family. Twice we told they're brothers. And many of them traveled as far as 50 kilometers um, in order to meet Paul on the road and greet him and welcome him. That is Christian hospitality at work there. That is God binding us together into relationships that, that, that overcome the boundaries of culture and ethnicity um, that are more like true family than than blood family. And that's why Paul, when he, when he sees this, he sees the work of the gospel. He sees what the gospel is doing in, in uniting these diverse people into one new man. And that's what he could write about in the letter to the Ephesians. This amazing, powerful work of the gospel. And so he can give thanks to God and take courage as he sees that God is always at work in everything for gospel good. What an encouragement when we can see the fruit of the gospel in the lives of the saints. To see how this message has worked in them, its powerful work and transformed them and united them with us and we can see Christ put on display. In every language, in every place, amongst every tribe and culture, the gospel takes root and produces believers, brothers and sisters united in Jesus Christ. And if you've traveled anywhere in the world and met up with believers you don't even know at once, you can sense this bond of unity 
that we have in the Gospel. A few years back we hosted a Bible translation conference here at the church and many of our families hosted delegates from different parts of the world and that was the, the constant testimony, the constant feedback we received back. How amazing it was to, to have these fellow believers in our homes that we've never met before and just sense the common bond, the common love, the common cause, the common interest in Christ, the common values and way of life and pursuits and goals, the common love. This is what the gospel does. This is the big picture of what God is doing. This is the global picture that the book of Acts is beginning to unfold for us and help us see. The gospel is speeding along to every tribe and language and people and nation and calling out from all of these tribes a people belonging to God and to one another in Jesus Christ. And Paul can just marvel at this and he's, he's so excited to be a part of it. He gives thanks to God. Thank you God that I can be a part of this mission that you're doing, this church that you're building, this gospel. Um, and he takes courage. And then thirdly we see uh, Paul in Rome in verses 17 to 28. Paul in Rome. After three days he called together the local leaders of the Jews and when they had gathered he said to them, Brothers, though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, but because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. It's interesting to find that the first thing Paul does when he, when he arrives at Rome is he goes to see his fellow Jews, the Jewish contingent in Rome. He's, nothing, he's got nothing against the Jews. And he wants it to make clear that the Jews actually have nothing against him. There's no real case. And then the Romans have nothing against him. There's no legal case against him. And here again in verse 17 and verse 21 we encounter this word brothers. Uh, but here it's been used uh, in a more physical sense of race and heritage and ethnicity. As Paul explains to, in his letter to the Romans, he has great concern for his own countrymen. He still loves his fellow Jews. And he's concerned that they might too receive the gospel and be saved. And so wherever Paul goes, he always makes a beeline for the synagogue, for his fellow Jews. And, and he makes this appeal to them, please be reconciled with God. Tries to convince them of the truth of the gospel. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Repent for the forgiveness of your sins. And according to verse 20, it's really because of this gospel, this gospel preaching that he's in chains and he's had all this affliction. But for, for Paul, this gospel is the hope of Israel. It's not some sect, it's not some new teaching, it's not something that you can't find in the Old Testament. And so he can try to convince them from the law and the prophets, basically the whole Old Testament, that, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the hope of Israel. That Jesus came as God's appointed Messiah for the Jews first and foremost. He was sent for God's covenant people and he's desperate for them to understand that, that God's Messiah is this Jesus who was crucified 
and raised from the dead. That's what he says in Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for the Jew first, but also for the Gentile. The gospel is first and foremost for the Jews. Jesus came for his people. But as the text goes on to show, they, they don't want to hear, they don't want to receive it, they don't believe it. Verse 23 tells us that from morning till evening, Paul explained from the scriptures, he tried to convince them from the scriptures, uh, that this Jesus is God's Messiah. This is the hope of Israel. But then they won't believe and they won't listen. And so he closes with this quote at the end of the day, which really disperses everyone and there's a mixed response. Some, some are convinced, some are fairly convinced, some are not convinced at all. And the quote is from Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 10. And it really sums up the Jewish response to the, to the gospel. The Jews would not receive the message. And we've encountered the same pattern throughout the book of Acts. Three times before, at Sidian Antioch in Acts 13, at Corinth, in Acts 18, at Ephesus, in Acts 19. In all the major cities of the ancient world, of the Roman Empire, Christ had been proclaimed first and foremost to the Jews, but they had largely rejected it. And now in the capital city of Rome, Luke gives us written testimony that the gospel was taken to the Jews by none less than the Apostle Paul and presented to them with with all the earnestness that he could summon and all the love for his people that he had. But they won't receive it. And the text of Acts here suggests what Paul makes more explicit in his letter to the Romans in, in chapter 9 to 11, that the, the Jewish rejection of the gospel opens the door for that gospel to then be taken to the Gentiles. That's how Paul ends here. He says, Therefore, because you won't hear, because you don't believe, because you won't listen, the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And it's, and it's almost like God is working even this hardening of the, of the Jewish hearts. He's working it together for gospel good. That the gospel can now be taken out beyond the Jewish nation, out to all those many nations, the Gentile nations who were far off, who are not the covenant people of God, who up until this point had not known the grace of God extended to them personally. And now it would be in the, in the message of the gospel. And so this quote from Isaiah 6 draws a contrast between seeing and not perceiving, between hearing and not understanding. There will be many people and many among the Jews will hear the message, but they don't really get it. It's not enough to hear the gospel. You have to hear with faith, with understanding, with sensing the impact and the significance of this gospel so that it produces a heartfelt response. And that's what verse 24 suggests. And some were convinced, but others disbelieved. And various translations have translated this as they disbelieved or they would not believe or they refused to believe, as the authorized version says. Because it's in the imperfect tense, indicating you know, something of a settled position, something of a definite decision to, to reject the gospel and, and to continue to reject it. They hardened their hearts against the gospel. That's what the text is saying. That's what Paul is saying. And that's why Paul closes with this warning. And that's the implication of this warning from Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 27. That there is a hardening that sets in over time, so that ignorance becomes apathy, and apathy becomes rejection, and rejection ultimately becomes a deliberate thrusting away of the gospel. That's what happens in a person's life when they will not hear, and will not receive, and will not believe, and they continue to reject the grace of God as it's made available in the gospel. And this warning is as applicable to the Jews in this context as what it is to us today. It's applicable to all of us all, all of us. If we don't heed God's word here and now and today, it is less likely that we will heed it tomorrow. If we don't heed God's word today and now, it is less and less likely 
that we will heed it tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to recognize what God is saying and what God is doing in Jesus Christ. And so you can just sense how the door is closing for Israel. And even as it's closing for Israel, God is throwing, up the door, throwing open the door of His grace to the Gentile nations because they will listen. And we sit here today in the church because as a testimony to that reality. The gospel has come to every place. It has spread to every part of the world geographically. And people from many, many tribes and languages have heard and have understood and have received and have embraced and have believed and have been transformed by this gospel and united into a multicultural, um, a global body, the Church of Jesus Christ. Which leads us to this closing scene in the book of Acts. Paul in prison in verse 30 and 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And the book of Acts ends with Paul in prison, but the gospel unleashed. Paul is in prison, but the gospel has been unleashed. Because God is working all things together for gospel good. That's what he could explain in his letter to the Philippians in Philippians 1. Even his imprisonment has only served to advance the gospel. Paul can see that in everything that's been happening in his life, the gospel is advancing. God is working it together for gospel good. And that's not only the message of this last narrative, that's the message of the book of Acts. That's what this book has really been all about. It's never been about Paul or Peter or the apostles or any other of the, the characters that come in and out of the narrative. They are mere servants of the gospel. This story has been about a much bigger story, the story that God is writing of the gospel spreading out from Jerusalem to all nations. And so this journey that we've been following for the last seven chapters uh, is like a mini narrative, the journey from Jerusalem to Rome, is like a small story which points us to the bigger story, the meta-narrative. The details of this journey have stretched across the last seven chapters, nearly a quarter of the book of Acts. And this is how a writer, when he writes narrative, can, can emphasize something by slowing the narrative down, by including more detail, by giving more space, more attention to certain events, he can emphasize those events. This is what the Gospels do. They devote nearly half of the Gospel to the events surrounding the death and resurrection of Christ. Because to understand who Jesus is and what He's doing, we must understand the events that unfolded uh, in His death, His crucifixion and His resurrection. This is the key that unlocks a right understanding of Jesus. And so in the book of Acts here, this narrative is slowed down because this story is a, a, a micro story, a mini story, a smaller version of the story of the book of Acts as a whole. Paul has been journeying from Jerusalem to Rome. Rome is the center of the ancient world. Literally, as the gospel has come to Rome, and Paul intends now to take the gospel out from Rome, the gospel has highways. That, that literally run out from Rome in every single direction and the gospel can now speed along uh, to the ends of the earth. That's where this fourth missionary journey has brought us. To the hub, the center of the ancient world from which the gospel now can launch out in cross-cultural international mission to all of the Roman Empire. And remember, this is how the book of Acts started, isn't it? Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commanded them to wait in Jerusalem until they've received power from on high. And then he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be empowered. You will be clothed with, with power on high and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Sumeria and even to the ends of the earth, to the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, the book of Acts has been about the power of God, carrying the messenger of God to every tribe and language and place in order, in order to accomplish the mission of God for the glory of God among the nations. Or put another way, God is working all things together for gospel good. 
all things in your life make sense in the light of what God is doing in you and through you to take the gospel to all people and all places. In Acts 19, 21, Paul conceived of a, a plan to, to journey to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem to Rome. And he explains in Romans 15 that the plan was a spirit-burdened plan, a spirit-led plan. And the plan was to come to Rome and use Rome as a platform to reach out to the rest of the world, particularly the western section of the empire, because the whole eastern section had been reached. But along the way, he's met with opposition and persecution and beatings and imprisonments and false accusations and assassination attempts and shipwrecks and sleepless nights and um, hunger and snake bites and thirst. Seven chapters and five years later Paul finally arrives at the destination that he had planned. And then he's still put in prison and must remain in prison for two more years. That's what this small narrative is, has been leading us along. And it's part of the bigger picture of the book of Acts. And the picture that goes even beyond the book of Acts. That God is carrying this gospel along. And he's got a plan and he knows the destination that this gospel will go into all the world. And by the power of God, people will be transformed and won to Jesus Christ. But as this gospel has gone out in the book of Acts, it's been in the midst of persecution and difficulty and imprisonments and beatings and divisions in the church and an assassination attempts and martyrdoms and dangers of every kind. But it's going out by the power of God, according to the plan of God, who works all things together for gospel good. That's the message of the book of Acts. And we are called to carry the tor torch of the gospel and those of us who are called to carry this torch are also called to take up our cross and carry it with perseverance and courage. To be a servant of the gospel is to be empowered to persevere through all kinds of suffering and overcome insurmountable obstacles so that the power of the gospel that we preach might be visibly manifest in us. That's the message of the book of Acts. Just turn in your Bibles for a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 as Paul explains the 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. This is what it means to be a gospel worker, a servant of the gospel. Working together with him, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We hold the message of the gospel out to people with clarity and conviction and urgency. We appeal to people on behalf of God, be reconciled to God. Now is the day of salvation. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Repent for the forgiveness of your sins. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. God has put this gospel into a, a carrier, a gospel carrier into the lives of Christians. And we carry this gospel along. We are the messengers. We are the good news. We are the feet that carry the good news. We commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as pure, poor yet making many rich, as having nothing but possessing everything. This is what it means 
to be a gospel servant. We take up our cross and we carry this message to all people. And so there's been this golden thread running through this last section of narrative. From when Jesus appeared to Paul in the prison and stood by him when he was so discouraged and alone in that prison cell and said, Take courage. As you've testified to me here, you will testify to me also in Rome. And so in the middle of the shipwreck, when all hope had gone, God sends a messenger again to Paul and, and the angel says, Take courage. And, and he relays this messenger to the sailors, Take courage. God has a gospel plan. He's working all things together for gospel good. As I've testified here, I will testify there. Even in the midst of the storm, God is working everything together for good. And as Paul finally arrives at Rome and he sees that the gospel has gone ahead of him and he sees the good that God has been working in the lives of these believers and their love and their transformation and their unity, he can see that God has been working all things together for gospel good. This is the message of Acts. God is working all things together for gospel good. And you will know His power and His provision and His protection so that you can bear witness to Him through every storm, through every obstacle, victorious, though difficult. So take courage. That's my word to you. And this is the closing word of the book of Acts. Take courage. God is working all things together for gospel good. Take courage.